and get uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for coming to the Rouse Seminar Series uh, this this beautiful Monday afternoon. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce Kevin Donkers from the uh, UK Med Office Inf Informatics Lab. Uh, he uh, he got his degree in chemical physics and did some chemical robotics research, which sounds kind of fun. And then joined the Met Office as a scientific software developer on the Art, Iris and Cardipi projects, which I'm sure, a lot, at least on Cardipi, a fair number of you probably use. Uh, and then joined the Informatics Lab in 2019. Currently, he's working on uh, data providence and workflow tracking. Today, he'll be giving kind of an overview of the Informatics Lab and all the different projects uh, going on, and especially some of the machine learning stuff. So, without uh, further ado, take it away, Kevin. Thank you, David John. Um, Hello everyone, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm from the Metaverse Informatics Lab. Uh, we are a small team um, who do sort of data science, data technology research. Um, the Met Office, as I'm sure most of you know, that's the, the UK's national weather forecasting service, but also um, the UK's national climate science institute. Um, so sort of a bit, a bit of both um, in the same building, but sort of 1,700 people based in Exeter and Devon, southwest of England. Uh, the Informatics Lab started about five years ago um, as uh, born out of a slight frustration of the, the lack of speed of movement inside science at the Met Office. Uh, so we're sort of a, a team that deliberately sort of embraces um, scientific method, but also agile technology development um, strategies and design thinking. So we have a designer from art school, we have technologists from um, inside the Met Office and from outside the Met Office, one of which has just gone to NVIDIA um, to do GPUs for machine learning, um, and scientists from the Met Office as well. Um, I myself, thank you Dave John for the introduction, yeah, uh, I'm a uh, kind of scientist, chemical physics background, um, dabbled in some robotics and various other random things before I joined the Met Office two years ago. I've been in the informatics lab, informatics lab for nine months. Um, it's lots of fun. Uh, if you want to come work with us, we're very welcome to have guests for as long as you like. Um, um, what I'll be presenting is mostly other people's work um, and a little bit of my own thoughts and work as well. Okay, so I outlined this talk. Um, I'm going to be chatting about data platforms, um, specifically Pangeo. Um, some of you may have heard of it. It's it's used in uh, NCAR and sort of across a lot of um, US scientific research organizations. Um, what it is and what we're doing with it now. Um, and then a bit of work on machine learning, which is definitely other people's work. I'm not a machine learning expert, though I'm happy to answer questions. Um, feel free to interrupt my talk at any time with questions or any comments. Um, I, I quite like an interactive talk, so um, do ask, ask away. OK, Pangeo first. Um, I'll chat to you about the inspiration for Pangeo first. Um, so a typical workflow uh, for of a data analyst or scientist might be this. So I have an idea um, or some insight, and I want to get some data or create some data. So I go looking for it. I put it into some sort of analysis platform. Uh, I do some analysis, probably with Python, not necessarily. Uh, I visualize that in some sort of way, and that gives me some more insight. And I go around right around this loop until out pops a nature paper, or even better, some applied science. Unfortunately, the reality is more like this. Um, I have an idea, I go look for some data, and I don't know where to find it. I don't know, it, it was made five years ago. Is that person still here? Uh, I have to go walk around. With, I, I have an anecdote from one of my colleagues walking around with a post it note around his floor plate, trying to find the scientist who will tell him where this piece of data is on our archive. Uh, then it turns out to be huge, pulling it down to your desktop isn't, isn't trivial. Uh, and then processing it is not trivial either because it turns out to be two terabytes worth of data. You finally got it to your machine, which in the case of the Met Office is a desktop computer for a lot of, um, for a lot of scientists. Um, do some analysis, it doesn't work or it takes a month to process. So you try and parallelize it. Uh, you completely rewrite your code and it turns out you run out of RAM when you do so. Uh, so you deal with the RAM issues, it turns out you've made, a, made an error anyway and the numbers you're getting aren't what you look for. Eventually you get something that you want to visualize. How on earth do you visualize something that's five dimensional? Um, you can see where the problems lie. So um, the, all these obstacles sort of lose the flow of what a scientist is trying to do. You want to have, have an idea 
and sort of test it. See if there's any 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 sort of credence to what you're what you're thinking. And if there is, then maybe go into a bit more sort of deep analysis. But if, if you're if it takes you weeks to get to the point where you're visualizing any uh, any processing, um, you sort of you can get to the point where you forget why you're even asking the question in the first place. Um, so this led to um, a project called Jade, where um, which was leveraging existing technologies at the time around sort of interactive um, data analysis, in this case through Jupyter, um, Jupyter notebooks, and um, a sort of scale, a easy, interactive, scalable compute um, library called Dask. So we created Jade, and at the same time, my colleague Neil Robinson uh, met Joe Hammond at AGU 2017. Uh, and after a few beers, they realized they were aiming at exactly the same thing. Uh, and they got together and coordinated some funding and created something called Pangeo. Uh, the first meeting was had in 2018 sometime. I can't remember exactly when. Um, where uh, up at Mesa Lab. Uh, and this was collaborated from all over, from technology, from the developers of these open source libraries that we were making, as well as interested scientists, interested um, both both here in Boulder and from across the United States and from the UK as well. And that, that led to the Pangeo project, which um, is sort of thriving today. Um, it is primarily in the UK and the United States. We're starting to get interest parties across Europe as well. Um, I don't know how many instances there are. There um, must be in the order of sort of 20, 30, from not just geosciences, um, but also from biology and um, neuroscience and financial um, uh, disciplines as well, because this isn't this isn't sort of strapped to the geosciences. It's meant to be a scalable, um, sort of a scalable, elastic, easy to use data analysis platform um, that you can use to analyze your data. So it primarily consists of, and it isn't it isn't you can't Pangeo isn't a bit of software that you install. It isn't even really a platform. It's just sort of an idea of of principles you want to bring together in order to make an easy thing that you can use and that other people can use. So we want a thin client front end um, so that we don't have to install a big bit of software on each of our computers. We can ask this through, for instance, a web browser. Uh, we want expressive geoscience tools or some other sort of science tools um, that allow us to sort of work with the mental models that are in a head instead of some esoteric implementation of um, a, a programming language. Um, we want an interactive scheduler so we when we need resource, um, we can we can get it relatively easily from wherever we're um, performing from within our thin client where, wherever we're performing our analysis um, because it's likely that our workloads are going to be bursty so we're, we're probably going to want um, uh, to analyze something and look at it for a while and analyze something and look at it for a while um, so we don't want to have a whole a, th a thousand CPU cores spinning the whole time that we might want to use them we want something that sort of distributes when we need it, ask for the resource it needs, and then scale back down when we don't need it. Uh, so that links to distributed computing, whether that be HPC or that be cloud computing, uh, and then a highly parallelized data store, because um, the amount of data that we're having to process now to do science um, is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and we're starting to hit roadblocks in terms of simply moving that, that um, data around, whether it's to analyze, whether it's to store it, whether it's to send it to somebody else or give it access to somebody else. So highly parallelized. Um, Data stores are very useful, um, and cloud computing has sort of uh, lent itself a lot to um, this technology. So, um, specific implementations now: uh, the Informatics Lab um, and the Met Office have um, sort of deployed our first Pangeo on Amazon Web Services. So, we use Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks um, as our sort of thin client front end. We primarily use Iris. I'm already probably use X-ray more often over here, but we use Iris as our sort of um, um, data model um, library, it's a Python library. Uh, we use Dask to, to schedule our work. We Kubernetes and EC2s as the actual distributed compute, and then Amazon S3 for our file storage, uh, which I'll go into some detail on later. Um, for, there's a hackathon happening this week up at Mesa Lab uh, and in a couple other places around the US. Uh, analyzing CMIP6 data, we're going to be using this uh, oceanpangeo.io. Um, and that's specifically for ocean sciences, but we're going to be using it for climate data. This uh, uses a slightly different model, Jupyter, but plus X-ray instead of Iris, um, Dask, and in this case, it's on Google, Google Cloud, um, uh, and everything stored in Google Cloud storage. But we're also going to be using uh, Cheyenne here in Boulder. Is it in Boulder? I think it's in Boulder. 
they use it in Boulder. Um, so here we use X-ray and Dask like like we were before, but un underneath we're using a Slurm scheduler, so it's a Q-based scheduler instead of Kubernetes, which is, is an elastic scheduler. Uh, and then having Glade storage um, where, we're, where we're accessing that CMOP6 data. So that's that's sort of the state of Pangeo as is at the moment. That's being actively developed, but it's kind of at a state that is being used by scientists in various organizations. Um, what we in the Informatics Lab are kind of interested in is what next. Um, we're not particularly interested in maintaining a, an instance of Pangeo ourselves. Uh, we use it, um, but we're not really in the business of, of maintaining that full time. We'd rather have technical people supporting that while we develop on top of. And so some of the things that we're developing on top of um, primarily are data cataloging. So easy access to data where you no longer need to think about file, files, file paths, where things are stored, what random format they're in, just actually dealing with data sets themselves. Um, there are so many good libraries now for abstracting data sets, and we start analyzing them straight away. Uh, we're, we're, um, there are libraries now that help us, um, technologies now that help us abstract away some of the pain, some of the repeated pain points that exist there. Um, as well as, da -da -da. oh yeah, the, um, pipelines, data pipelines. So being able to um, sort of compose pipelines um, and repeatably uh, version control, be able to repeat an analysis I did a month ago exactly. Um, so let's go through those. Uh, so first of all, data cataloging. Um, we want it to be, um, we would hope that, well, in an ideal world, and this is implemented, we would want to be able to import uh, a week's worth of weather forecast data um, in three lines of Python. And this is what we've implemented this. Um, so we got a five dimensional cube. It pulls together a whole lot of data that's stored in Amazon S3. Um, it's done so lazily, so it just pulls in the metadata. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't pull any data around. This takes a little while to, uh, it takes a matter of 20, 10, so 10, 20 seconds, it could be sped up, um, to get all this metadata. And then we can start working with this metadata um, to start keying up our analysis. We don't, it's, it, we don't move any data around until we absolutely need to, until we actually do our analysis. So we might do a reduction over this, we might pull out just a certain area, um, so a flat long area of, of our data. We might do some other bespoke analysis on this. And it's not until we get a plot or we actually want some, some data out, out the back of it does it actually execute anything. And it builds up um, Dask, that, uh, the library Dask builds up a, a network of processing in the background and only executes it when it absolutely has to, or you request to do so. Um, so, um, not only not only does that allow us to access large amounts of data, but it also allows us to easily sort of have a look around at what's available. So, in this case, we can see that um, we simply call intake .catalog dot and this is Met Office AWS Earth. So that's um, through AWS. Uh, they provided us funding to store some uh, a rolling latest for um, seven days of forecast data with them from our four, client, four um, numerical weather prediction um, models. I pick a certain model and then I have all these variables that are available to me. And I can, I can look through those and see what's available to me. There is, there is a GUI interface as well that's, getting, that's currently being developed. Um, and so instead of having to walk around with a post-it uh, looking for the right person to ask where that data is stored in an, in an archive, um, I have catalogs that, that sort of abstract away that pain for me. Um, and we, uh, in our particular implementation on Amazon AWS Earth, um, we, it's all stored in, big, in small chunks, NetCDF files, um, and I think it's tens of thousands of NetCDF files stored for about two terabytes of data, for a week's worth of forecast data. Uh, it would be a big job even to pull in the metadata for that. So we've, because we know what the um, we know what the forecast parameters are, what the metadata should look like. We actually we've implemented um, a Python library that simply pulls in the metadata from one and it extrapolates it according to some rules that we've defined. Because we know what the model looks like um, and, and what the what sort of the size of the five D cube should be. Um, so it generates that for us, um, which reduces a huge amount of time in just simply gathering the metadata. Um, here in Boulder, um, Intake ESM is a library that's been developed as well. Again, it's a data cataloging um, library. Uh, in this case, accessing CMIP5 data on Glade, uh, but there are many other um, 
uh, climb data sort of data sets stored through this. Um, ESM in this case stands for uh, Earth System Model, and so I think there's um, about five different types of um, large climate data sets, uh, including CMO6, which we are accessing for the hackathon later this week. Um, Anderson and Matt have been primarily involved in developing this. Um, and yeah, so for the hackathon at the end of the week, that's what we'll be at. Um, so data pipelines is another aspect that we're interested in. Uh, that we don't currently have a huge implementation for. Um, if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you'll know that you can sort of create a workflow from top to bottom. It's pretty good for sort of getting your thoughts in order and doing sort of analyses one after another, or um, step, process steps on one after another. Um, but you can, how do you formally store that? So we use, we use version control for software, which is, which is sort of revolutionized the, the reproducibility of software. Um, and the reliability of software. We haven't quite got to the same point for um, data and data processing and data analysis and actually even machine learning um, experiments. Um, if I want to, if I generated a machine learning model and I may want to um, uh, run a different, uh, a sort of an updated version of a piece of data or a new piece of um, data through that as, a, an ex as another experiment to see whether it works, um, I need to be able to record um, the version of the model I've made, and perhaps even the process I've gone through to make that model, um, the new version, the version of data, and the metadata of the data that I'm using, um, and any sort of metrics that I'm, I'm storing. Because I want to see whether this this new data works well in my machine learning model. Um, I need to be able to record um, the actual number that comes at the end, and whether it's improved or got worse, and whether it's what I expect. Um, you can't use Git for that at the moment, but you can use something called DVC, uh, which is called Data Version Control. Um, this is something I've been researching and trying to see how it can integrate with Pangeo. I haven't quite got as far as I would like with it, but um, it's sort of on my radar. Um, <clears throat> it, has been, it was built by somebody who does a lot of data science and a lot of machine learning, um, wanting a tool for reproducibility of their, um, their experiments and workflows. Um, so it's a command line tool. It's built on top of Git. Um, it defines you define pipelines in a in a file, um, much like you define steps of software development in in a Git file. Dot Git file. Um, it allows you to point to remote data, and it uh, has a unique ID, so a hat, some sort of hash for each version of data, each version of the software you're using, and each version of your model um, that you create. And basically, with these three hashes, it can then create a unique ID for um, each experiment you do. So if you change, just want to change your data, it then um, branches off, and you can run that as a new experiment. Um, I'm yet to fully road test this, um, but I've seen some very, very promising um, results from it. It's used widely, particularly in the financial uh, financial sector for um, machine learning and data science. Um, and it's even got its own version of GitHub uh, called DAGS Hub, which allows you to visualize, um, allows you to visualize your um, data, data processing pipelines or machine learning algorithm. Um, this sort of leads, if, if we're able to do this, um, something we're particularly interested in at the Met Office is, um, can we, for forecasters, um, get some sort of provenance chain or provenance graph for um, a weather forecast that goes out. So if there's a particular event, we can, uh, if there's a particularly catastrophic event or um, there's strong disagree disagreement about um, the consequences of a forecast going out from the Met Office, we're able to A, trace exactly um, what decisions were made uh, if, this, if this is implemented automatically rather than being generated after the fact. Um, we are able to trace exactly the, the decisions that were made and who made them in order to be able to um, uh, respond to any um, litigation or just simply queries about decisions we make. But also, we're able to analyze then what goes into making a forecast and perhaps what parts we're missing, um, where can we develop our expertise, where can we um, send funding to improve um, to improve our forecast overall. Um, does increasing the resolution of our numerical weather prediction models actually improve the forecast skill, or are we better um, investing in, in people skill, um, in post-processing, in um, maybe some sort of machine learning to speed up certain parts of it. <clears throat> um, so along with data catalogs and Pangeo and um, sort of data pipelines, 
Um, they all sort of come together as a potential framework on which we can um, help scientists uh, go from science to services. So the Met Office, we have two divisions, one called operations and one called science. And we don't currently talk to, talk to each other as well as they could, primarily because scientists develop something in Python. It's determined that it's probably maybe useful for operations. So they find some funding, or they are given some funding. They then have to describe what they've done in Python to a developer in technology, who will probably re try and recreate it, um, usually in a slightly waterfall style. Uh, in Java and JavaScript to make it interactive for forecasters to use or customers to use, uh, and then the product is delivered. However, this can take months, if not years. Um, it is prone to uh, mistakes. Um, it can take a long time because funding has to be approved. Um, and the insight the scientists had to make the thing that they wanted to make might not really be um, conveyed to a developer who is more interested in technology and how they're going to make it. <clears throat> so how we envision um, some technologies I've, so I've shown you and, and some other bells and whistles that we added on top afterwards is that instead of creating a linear pipeline in which scientists develop some stuff, they, um, they talk to techies and stuff, something's delivered at some point in the future, it, how about a technology team is supporting some sort of fabric, a bit like a, a Pangeo, um, in which scientists are already working but can also be used to deliver something. So whether that be a dashboard to show the status of the supercomputer, whether that be a dashboard to show um, uh, alerts for particular weather events, uh, for managing traffic for um, the high Highways England, um, for showing uh, solar flares to uh, as an interactive um, website for the public um, or for weather forecasters themselves. Um, so there's a lot of potential here that we are currently in the process of, sort of developing and exploring um, and trying to get the Met Office on board with helping us achieve. Okay, so that's my ramblings about data platforms. Um, this is now getting into machine learning, which I know quite a bit less about, but I think you all know a lot more about it than I do. Um, I'm going to run through sort of the four, three or four projects that we are currently ongoing, uh, that are currently ongoing with the, within the Met Office and within the informatics lab. Um, where, what we've done, what we're hoping to do, and maybe some thoughts on where it might go next. Uh, we'll start off with Nowcasting. So this is a project uh, between uh, Met Office, the Informatics Lab, Exeter University, and Google DeepMind. So Rachel's in my team and doing PhD at the University of Exeter. Sam's just about to join our team from the Met Office. Dimitri works at the University of Exeter, and these two work at Google DeepMind. Um, who is familiar with how numerical weather prediction works? Most of them, good. Okay, don't have to explain that too much. Uh, okay, we take observations, we run them through some, some equations in a model, uh, and we try and extrapolate our observations forward in time to try and understand what the weather's going to do in the future. That involves data simulation, um, and there's some very gnarly stats to help you assimilate data into your forecast. So that forecast is running, but as that forecast is running, we're making more observations of the atmosphere. And so to improve our forecast, we want to assimilate those observations into the model that's already started running. There is a way to do this, do this and it works, but there's sort of a couple of problems. One, it takes quite a long time. Uh, it could take an hour or so to achieve, and it, it's hugely expensive. Um, and it's not perfect. It sort of creates a bit of a statistical shock, which is mitigated to some, some extent, but not 100%. And so that statistical shock to our model actually means that the, there's less skill um, soon after our observations are assimilated into our model than further down the line. Which creates sort of this window is that we're, we're kind of interested in what the weather's going to do for the next few hours. There's quite a lot of um, important insight in there. And then a lot of people are interested in getting a very short, short reach forecast. Um, so what we are proposing is completely not using numerical weather prediction and instead using some sort of machine learning model to take observations that they are now and, sent, and creating sort of uh, an approximation of what uh, a numerical weather prediction model does for about three hours, maybe less. I think at the moment they're working with just half an hour's worth of data in sort of six, five minute time steps. Uh, at the moment, based mainly on rainfall radar, so that's the data they're primarily using at the moment, and using some sort of stream flowing, just sort of how, how does it travel forward in time. 
So the primary technique that has been used so far, and this is an ongoing project, the primary technique that's been used so far is uh, optical flow techniques, which uses uh, neural networks, I believe, deep neural networks. Um, at the, uh, the current metrics for measuring um, sort of the skill of a forecast, of a numerical forecast, shows that it is outperforming those traditional metrics, which is, I think, root mean square, some sort of root mean square metric. However, <clears throat> meteorologically, we find that the results are not very useful because it just, it, yes, it technically achieves a better number out of the end, but it sort of smears the results out, which you can't see so well here, but if you extrapolate it then even further in time, it just sort of averages and there's just a sort of rain everywhere. Um, so that's not so useful. <clears throat> so where we are hoping to go in the future, um, is to find better verification techniques. How do, we f how do we verify both traditional numerical weather prediction um, and these new, um, <clears throat> uh, this sort of machine learning based now casting, such that they, they take much more spatial temporal information into it rather than sort of more, uh, purely stati statistical analysis, as root mean square would be. Um, two, we want to um, sort of sample from a predictive distribution. Uh, which involves sort of generative models, uh, which in the moment traditional verification doesn't really, it sort of penalizes quite hev heavily. Um, as well as we want to sort of account for the, um, the inherent unpredictability, particularly of um, convective scale, uh, convective scale precipitation. Um, we're less interested for this project in um, sort of synoptic scale precipitation because that's relatively easy predict to predict anyway um, by eye. But because convective scale can sort of spontaneously um, happen, um, occur, um, we want to be able to create a model that can hopefully predict that. Can, can a machine learning model even predict the, the sort of spontaneous um, generation of convective scale showers? Um, and we also found that um, using simple optical flow produced something, but it completely ignored the existence of mountains, for instance. Um, it, it didn't conserve things like um, energy. Um, and something else. Um, so we want to be able to somehow incorporate these physical priors into the inputs of a, numerical, of a neural network, um, but also perhaps constrain for things like conservation of energy. Um, okay, so that's uh, our now casting. Feel free to ask questions at any point. Uh, the next project is uh, Rachel Pruden's uh, downscaling work. So what's the problem? Um, we're getting arguably diminishing returns of skill for the more investment we put into numerical weather prediction. So despite increasing resolution, we aren't necessarily getting as much improvement in our forecasts as we were from previous investments in, in resolution. This goes particularly for convective scale processes, um, which are much more demanding sort of computationally um, and from a sort of physics point of view than synopsis scale processes, and so they're, they're inherently hard to predict, and just simply increasing the resolution doesn't he necessarily help predict those. Um, despite, but convective uh, scale processes sometimes have the highest impact weather, big thunderstorms, for instance. Um, there's also the problem of the fact that they're, they're kind of hard physics, uh, or they're not as easy physics as synopsis scale, numerical weather prediction. So the question sort of is, can we take low, re low resolution model output and create a machine learning model that, that downscales it to increase the resolution to give us some sort of idea um, where sort of higher resolution convective um, events are likely to occur. Is this possible? Should we even be trying? Um, so the experiment that Rachel's done is she's taken some high resolution observations to sort of test against and reduce the resolution of those uh, and then simulate downscaling of that then low resolution field using something called Gaussian random fields, which is a generative model. Um, and then from that, um, getting plausible high resolution outputs and comparing that to the original input that she had, the original high, high resolution convection field. Um, and it kind of works. Um, uh, I say kind of work, it does work. Um, downscaling and normalize, so uh, uh, she's using wet bulb potential temperature data rather than rainfall or climate cover, which would be more reflective of convective scale stuff, but they're extremely non-Gaussian uh, in their distributions and wet bulb potential temperature is. So she's working with that for now. Um, so yeah, she takes, takes original high resolution 
um, downsamples it, and then generates a, uh, uh, creates a generative model using Gaussian random fields, which, for instance, would create um, the mean of that generative model looks comparable. And out of that, you, you generate random fields. Now, the problem at the moment is exactly how do you compare that, that to that? How, how do we determine um, the skill that has been gained there? Um, and it turns out that's kind of non-trivial. Um, <laughs> again, it comes a bit. It comes back to you can't doing um, sort of mean squared error analyses doesn't quite cut it for um, generative models and the types of experiments we're doing. Um, we're looking again. We're looking for sort of better spatiotemporal analysis techniques and comparisons. Um, one technique we're looking at uses machine learning as well to verify this. Um, trying to create, uh, I think it's using um, a GAN, um, an adversarial network, to try and determine. Um, what ensemble members from an ensemble prediction have come from the same origin. So if you have, um, you start you start numerical weather predictions off in roughly the same space, they extrapolate forward in time and you get a spread. You then take some other ensemble members from a completely different forecast and you get a model to try and work out which ones originate from, from the same point and which ones are just ran, are, are unrelated fields. This could be very useful here in Analyzing does our um, does our Gaussian random field uh, method actually generate comparable um, rain fields, convective scale fields to the original? Uh, wet bulb potential temperature is not necessarily the best physical field to be using, um, and we would we would want to incorporate other physical fields potentially to make a more more reliable prediction. Um, Rainfall and cloud cover are non-Gaussian, but uh, other, other distributions we can use to describe them better. Uh, it's also very expensive at the moment um, and doesn't scale particularly well, so that's something Rachel's working on as well. Oh, we also had, we want to add time evolution because we want to see what the weather's going to do in the future, and at the moment it's on relatively small scales. We want to extend it to the UK, which is difficult given how expensive the current model is. Okay, causality. This is not something. This is something our our group is thinking about and discussing with others. Um, we haven't done any work on it as yet, so I'm going to introduce the work of um, uh, Jakob Runge and um, Marlene Kretschmer, um, who gave some talks at the um, Climate Informatics Workshop in Paris last week, two weeks ago, um, which you, which for many years it was in Boulder. Um, uh, their work on causality and working out um, relations between um, processes and how that can be used um, for hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing. Okay, so um, paper down here if you're interested. Um, so we have large scale sort of time series data sets of various processes in the Earth system. Um, and Runge and his team sort of proposed sort of analysis techniques, statistical analysis techniques to determine the causal links between those processes and in particular directions of those of those of those links. Um, the sort of inciting example that they gave was if you take um, if you take El Nino sort of Enzo data and correlate it with um, air temperature anomalies in the Americas, um, you can show that uh, Enzo affects air temperature anomalies in, in the Americas. But if you do the analysis the other way, you can show that temperatures, air temperature uh, anomaly in the Americas affects ENSO, which isn't how we understand the process to go. But when you uh, analyze it from a purely statistical point of view, um, you can see that there's a sort of a, a sort of bi-directional causal effect, which doesn't really make sense from a physical point of view. So their process uh, sort of um, scrutinizes the, um, the data and the links and the statistics to determine the directionality and the strength of which the, um, those links go. So it's called PCMCI, which so I, I spent all of last night trying to find out what PC algorithm is, and I could not find anywhere what it is. So it's a PC algorithm, which is some sort, of, uh, which is a causal, um, a, yeah, a causal algorithm, statistical algorithm, for determining causality, and they've added momentary conditional independence on top of that. 
um, which I think brings in the fact this factor here about um, process auto strength. What processes are are feeding back into themselves? Um, we may see an effect, but actually, is that just it stimulating itself? Does I don't know the snow over a continent create more snow because it's simply cooling down the air in that continent or reflect, uh, preventing some more radiation being from from being absorbed, for instance? So their their method uh, describes causal strength, causal direction, causal lag time, which is a very important factor. Um, and process of the strength. So an example that, the, that uh, Marlene gave in a talk in Paris was about the um, stratospheric polar vortex. So, he, so she found two papers, um, both concluding that they, the process that they had analyzed affected the stratospheric polar vortex. Um, they didn't determine the strength, they just said it affected it. So those papers were looking, the first one was looking at um, Antarctic sea ice, um, and the other one was looking at Eurasian snow. And she said, well, how, how can I apply the technique that we've been working on to determine how, whether, these, um, whether these conclusions are true, whether the, their hypothesis about um, it influencing stratospheric polar vortex is true, and if so, how much? Because surely these, um, these processes will also be linked in some sort of, some sort of way. And so she included um, the, uh, the Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, I don't know what reflux is. And this is to do with, I can't quite remember. It's to do with air potential temperature, I think. Uh, Ural, SPT, and Siberian uh, SLB. Um, and sort of put in all the, all the time series data and determined that, yes, Eurasian snow affects um, polar vortex, but not as much as sea ice. So in here, we're seeing the the color of the circle, the darker the circle, the more um, influence, sorry, i say it again. The darker the circle, the more auto strength it has. So sea ice heavily affects itself. Uh, Eurasian snow mildly affects itself. Atlant uh, the um, polar vortex doesn't affect itself. And then the links between them determine the strength and the direction. So this arrow pointing up here um, in blue actually means that it's going the other way. Uh, and then there's month-long lags um, as numbers on these links. And so that's, that's deeply insightful into then um, how these processes affect one another. And perhaps there is a, um, a process here that's not been accounted for. How does V-flux affect sea ice, for instance? Um, so not only does this test hypotheses that have been determined, um, using time series data, but also can highlight existing links that perhaps people had not considered before um, and could lead on to further research in order to explain. Okay. This is my last slide. Physics-driven machine learning. I only have questions for this bit. I realize I put it in the, in the brief and actually I don't have a lot to say about it <laughs> other than to sort of pick your brains, like who's been thinking about this? Um, how do we include physics into, for instance, neural networks? Um, do we just put it into the inputs? Do we include some sort of clever layering that do slightly non-neural things? Do we, do we restrain them with ordinary differential equation layers? Um, do, how do we constrain stuff like uh, conservation of energy? Do we simply put um, heavy loss functions that penalize any behavior that points in that direction? Um, is that still not enough? Um, if there's, is there still too much of a window there in that loss function? And do we have to constrain it in some other means? Um, I don't know. These are, these are questions that we're sort of discussing at the moment. Um, and are there other machine learning techniques other than neural networks or other types of neural networks that are better at learning the sort of laws of physics? Um, do, they, do they lend themselves to, to sort of the laws of physics falling out um, or being inherently constrainable? I um, don't know. Your thoughts would be very welcome. Um, that's my talk. Thanks very much. Any questions? Thanks. It's a, a 
fascinating talk and just so much stuff to talk about in here but going going way back mm -hmm. um to the pangeo section yep so i've worked with the pangeo stack a fair bit mm -hmm. um and you know, because i've worked with it i realized there are a lot of rough edges yep and that's that's fine right it, it's still at this emerging stage but i was nervous when you said something in your talk about to the effect of well we don't want to be supporting these we just kind of want to be doing stuff on top of it mm -hmm. Somebody's got to support it. Yes. And I don't know if it's going to be you, but you. So when I say we, I, I don't mean everyone in this room. I mean specifically the informatics lab. The informatics lab is um, we are, we del we're deliberately agile to um, produce prototypes only. We do not produce anything operational, and that's deliberate because we are in a position to be flexible in an organization that is inherently inflexible due to mainly its mission to, to keep the lights on to produce forecasts and so we are there to give insight it's like look this is a thing this would be really cool we don't we as a small at the moment we're only six people um we're, we're always aiming to be 10 but no more we can't maintain that but we we strongly advise that we that we get a technical team behind that to prop it up and that's what we're kind of working on the moment in the Met's office and uh for instance ncar is quite good at with them um, uh, their sizzle team so i wasn't saying that it shouldn't be supported i'm saying we as as the informatics lab should not be supporting that, but somebody definitely should, and it should be money and people put towards that. And so if I still have the mic and I don't see any other hands up, so I'm going to take one more swing. Oh, good. Well, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so the you mentioned using GANs as another way to verify forecasts, essentially, just determine whether they're better or not. Um, that lends itself to the potential of saying that one forecast is better. Because it does look more, it, it matches more of the spatial statistics of the observations, which is good, mm -hmm. but it may not actually be a more useful forecast, right? On some levels, a, a smooth forecast is actually more useful for some some people, for some things, Rain right? everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you haven't looked at some of the more traditional metrics like uh, rank histograms, root spread scale reliability, to understand, you know, you have a method of producing an ensemble of forecasts. Does that have a more statistically reliable forecast than your single smooth best answer? That's an excellent question. I don't know. I don't know if we're doing that. Um, I'll ask when I get home. <laughs> but that's a, that's a very good point. Just because just because we're using machine learning models doesn't mean all previous stats is out the window. Like it's still entirely relevant. There's some powerful stuff there. Um, we, we, something that my that's what colleague Neil always says is that machine learning is just fancy stats. Um, it's not really, it's not anything as magical as it's sometimes made out to be. Um, it's, it's new, sure, but it's, it's still just doing statistics, really. Um, so, well, yeah, okay, that's, all, that's debatable. But, in the, but it doesn't mean all, all statistics out the, out, out the sort of window. Um, it's still very relevant. Good point. So I have another question about a Pangeo. Mm -hmm. So you showed a lot of uh, uh, examples uh, with uh, model graded fields. And I wonder how much effort is also put on observations with, uh, you know, non-graded data and a lot more diversity, and uh, how much is already there, and how many people are working on Pangeo for the observations? That's a brilliant question. Not enough people are working on it. I can't think of a single example um, of observational data as a data set that's available. Um, so are, are you specifically talking about what data sets are available or um, the analysis tools that are there for sort of more point-like data instead of grid? I, I guess both. Yeah. Okay, so um, in terms of point-like data, there is, um, yes, I guess the Dune Sciences have done a lot of, uh, in terms of tooling for gridded data, um, but there is just as powerful a, a sort of community behind point-like data and tabular data. Um, so there's there's a lot to be leveraged there from other communities uh, that exist, and uh, there are geo geo science versions of those definitely. Um, what we are currently struggling is getting um, support for observational data. So there's, a, for instance, a lot of satellite data um, available. Um, I can't I can't really think of any examples of more like meteorological points of observation data. We would love to see more of that, and actually part of the um, now casting project there was a lot of effort was put into getting that data out of the Met Office um, as as well as other institutions um, to then make it available to the team to then doing their, their machine learning work. Um, so yeah, there is, there's a, we're kind of at the point now where a lot, uh, despite the rough edges, there's there's a lot of the tooling in place. We're now what just kind of need the, the data available, the easy data available to start 
then connecting things together and, and testing things out quickly again, creating this in, this sort of insight loop of like, okay, let's see if that goes with that. Oh, there's nothing really in that. Or, oh, I did this experiment. It works really well. Can we actually get some more people on board and see if this is a thing, maybe a paper? Yes, um, I'm uh, very familiar with the Met Office now casting work for rainfall. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I say the Met Office has been leading the world in that area. So I, I was very curious when you said you're moving towards a machine learning approach. Do you think the current methodology is not sufficiently accurate or is just this is just an exploration into this the is an latest exploration. exploration. Okay. Apologies if my statement was a bit strong. I don't, we're not, what we're doing here is not on the proviso that um, like net casting is broken where you're having to fix it. It's more that this, um, so Rachel spent a lot of time sort of exploring the aspects of the Met Office that are sort of ripe for um, experimentation with machine learning. And one of them was now casting because of this. Uh, and yeah, there, there's, there's been a lot of work put into it, but could we get a nice lightweight emulation of that um, using machine learning? Maybe we can't, maybe this, maybe this work will show that actually it's, it's, it's sort of so difficult or it's so nuanced or perhaps on some metrics, yes, it works out well, but actually meteorologically, it still isn't very useful information to get from this machine learning model and the traditional methods are better. Um, so yeah, it's very much an exploration at this point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've seen some work that we've done and you gain maybe 5%. So the question, is it worth the extra effort? Yeah, yeah. So thanks. Thank you. I have a, a question going back to the the point you're, you're talking about, the, the basically spinning up the projects, but then handing, trying to hand it off to someone else to actually implement. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems like a, it's a very challenging handoff in a lot of organizations. And I'm wondering what, what kind of steps has the informatics lab been taking to try to make, make their prototypes as hand offable as possible? That's a very good question. Um, we communicate, or we at least strive to communicate as, as well as we can, with both internally in the Met Office and externally. Um, about what we're doing. Um, so that involves insight on, for instance, I'll write a blog post about coming here and the things I've learned from coming here, but also um, things like um, how-tos for different technologies that we've been working with and we've spent the time to try and learn about. Um, so of our thinking behind why we're why we're pursuing work like Pangeo, what is the what's the motivation behind that? That sort of helps if you if you've if you've communicated to a wider audience why you're doing something, it becomes easier then when you have the meetings around actually supporting that thing that you've made because more people have sort of gone through the slow sort of digestion of thinking, oh yeah, I guess it's kind of a problem. I guess I can see where that where that is being addressed. We still struggle, we still struggle to get um, support for certain things and to an extent we are influencing culture as much as technology. Um, so for instance, um, enthusiasm about cloud computing um, wouldn't have happened. That, like, it was it was in Francis Lab in the Met Office. I was pushing cloud computing and tested it, and sort of again, sort of like working out the landscape of it and where does it really fit? Is it usable in the Met Office? And now we are pushing everything. Well, almost we're, we're pushing as much as we sensibly can onto onto the cloud. We're a, a, a partner with AWS. Um, laptops. Laptops weren't really a thing in the Met Office and until we were walking around with our MacBooks and then people started going, oh, why don't we have laptops? That'd be really useful. And it then after a few months it became a thing and all of a sudden people started, it became policy that everyone started getting laptops instead of having big hunky desktops on the, on the other desk. So it's as much cultural as it is handing off projects. And I think one of the things that we kind of struggle with sometimes, it depends on the project, is the handing off. We we try our best, but we're only a small team, and at some, sometimes we're pulled in many different directions. Um, and sometimes we have to say no to stuff, and sometimes we have to say yes to a bunch of things, and stuff gets, yeah, stuff gets delivered when it gets delivered and the condition is delivered in. Um, but we're never trying to produce a product that somebody is going to use. We want to create a product that proves a concept. Um, and we never want to get more than that because then we risk someone just slotting it and just just plugging it in and leaving it running and it, it might it might fall over in a week in a month because they they haven't invested the support to actually go okay hey, where does this actually fit within our organisation? Uh, 
Okay, if there aren't any more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker one more time.